Mad Pants》，你完全看得见。Yeah, yeah. I think last time I talked to you, it was it was by Zoom. That's that's our life now, I guess, huh? No doubt. For a little Pandem while. Pandemic, pandemic has changed so much. I mean, this is one of the things that's changed. Maybe we, one of the things I think we can talk about are some of the the weird sort of silver linings about the pandemic. But uh, this is one of them, man. Being able to connect with people on Zoom and uh, how 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 have you fared for the, with these weird last two years? What what have been some of your challenges? How how, how have you dealt with it? Uh, really, I, I think I got really lucky in just that the line of work that I'm in recording bands in my studio, you know, being around an, a limited number of people in a controlled environment made it pretty easy for me to get back to a safe place without really too much time elapsed. Mm -hmm. And once the pandemic started, people wanted to record music i mean everybody was excited they were not playing shows as much anymore so everybody turned their attention towards documenting what they were doing and trying to be productive in any way they could so it, it felt dangerous at first and and especially because we didn't understand how much surfaces were mm -hmm. were transmitting the virus yeah. versus airborne you know transmission and it was a very strange thing to just have to trust your good friends that were in your bubble to truly, you have to really trust them to be honest about their interactions. And that's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And it proved, you know, I would tell other people how safe I was being. And then I would, of course, catch myself breaking the rule in some small way. And it just, it just becomes this, this mind game it, it, that where you just, you just feel like, can I trust, can I even trust how I perceive anything yeah. that I, did my, you get it? Did, yeah. did you get it, COVID? Eventually I did. It took a long time. It's possible that I got it during those, during that first, you know, year or first six months. Mm -hmm. But Julie and I, Julie, my wife is very cautious about what has always been very cautious about COVID more, more than me. Partially just, uh, she has parents that are, um, that would be at risk, you know, and, and also she's just a person who doesn't want it to, it's just needlessly taking a risk. It just doesn't make sense to her. Whereas I just happen to be by my nature, more happy go lucky and, and less, I'm just less aware of, of risks like that. And that, that, that's just a function of our personalities. Basically one of the great reasons why we're such a good couple is because of that. I kind of bring her out of her shell and she kind of helps keep me grounded and you know helps helps me to realize that life is not as ideal as i think it is and that you know i, I kind of float from thing to thing i'm like you know very much believing in the goodness of human beings all the time i just am like that i i just think that if you live your life that way you will be a happier person and yeah. it will it will help to draw good people towards you and, uh, and I'm not trying to contrast this with the way Julie thinks about the world, but, sure. but, um, but that is true. What I'm saying is true that, that I know that that has happened for me, that the fact that I, that I trust people and that I expect the best from them helps to bring out their best. And it is also true that that makes me vulnerable to being taken advantage right. of on some levels. Right. And I, I can accept that. I mean, so far I, I, I am a very fortunate person, so I guess I have all of this extra padding in my life that when something goes a little bit wrong for me, it's not the end of the world. You know, I can, I still have the, the means to course correct. And that's not because I was born into like a rich family or anything, but you know, obviously part of it is just, I, I was born in America. I was born, you know, a white man in America at this time. If you think about what if we were born a hundred years earlier, right? Right. Just how much, how much more difficult our lives would be in a practical way, but that has, doesn't actually mean that we would be any happier because oftentimes, as far as I can tell, the more comfortable you are really doesn't make you ha essentially happier to your core. It just makes things easier for you. Mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. experienced any additional happiness based on my comfort level. 
the times when I've almost been most happy have to do with when I've been most satisfied. And sometimes that's when I have the biggest challenges and I'm able to overcome some of those. Because that just feels, humans are just, we've just evolved to be that kind of animal that we want over, we want challenges, we want to overcome something. We need, we don't need drama, but we, we need to fight against something or to overcome something. And, and I'm definitely no exception. I, I, I just love that. And I guess it's been on some levels, I've been doing the same thing. I've been recording bands for at least 30 years. Is that right? Yeah. Dead. Yeah, I, I want to get into that. I want to ask you about yeah. that, but, but yeah. let's, let's stay on this for just a second. I also and we will eventually back up and have you. I have a couple of kind of biographical things I want that I was planned to start with, but you just, just jumped right in, which is far out, man. But uh, let's stay on this happiness thing for a second. You know, it's uh, uh, you, you may or may not be aware that this is a, a subject that is being studied uh, now in a way that really hasn't been in the past. Harvard is one of the main places, but there's several places uh, pretty pretty significant institutions that are studying happiness you know what is it uh how do we get it uh um and and there's some interesting how do we keep it how do we get it back when we've lost it uh do we even need to be happy how do we define it these kind of things and one of the interesting things is some of the interesting findings are the first of all that people are just terrible at predicting what's going to make them happy we're, we're just awful <laughs> we're awful about that uh, but uh, uh uh, there's there's really several things about it I think that are that are are kind of profound, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, the way this works in terms of you mentioned you know the um, just the fact that we live in this time. I mean we we can turn a little handle and we have wa fresh water. Yeah, you know, exactly. uh, and and are you in Denton? Is that right, or are, where are you? I'm north of Denton. I, I've lived yeah. north of Denton for a long time. My yeah. wife and I just bought a piece of land. Um, a new piece of land last year, but we've been north of town for a long time. And I know it's below freezing there right now. It, it, it is. It, it's cold there right now. And and yet you're comfy and warm and not even wearing a sweater. So exactly. we, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. This, uh, but as I recall, the way that works is if you are kind of below the poverty line where you don't have fresh water, you don't have heating and cooling, and et cetera, you don't have a steady diet, uh, it's pretty difficult to be happy. Uh, likewise, if you're filthy rich, and this is counterintuitive, a lot of us want to believe that money doesn't buy happiness. Well, it doesn't buy long-term happiness, but the truth is, if you have a billion dollars and you're depressed, you know, you can, you can do some pretty radical things to get yourself out of, out of your funk. For the vast majority of us, it, there's really no relation between our, the amount of money we make, the amount of material possessions we have, et cetera, and our happiness level. And, and, and I, I think that's liberating to know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, man, let's back up a little bit. One of the things, I mean, you, you're so many, you wear so many hats. Uh, I, I first knew you as a drummer and I want to ask you about your drumming. Um, but you're also a recording engineer, a producer, a photographer. Yeah. Uh, did I miss anything there? Uh, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's all. It's a lot. And, I'm a and very good husband. What, what's that? I said I'm a very good husband. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure you are, man. I'm sure you are. Uh, and how would you, how do you describe yourself? I'm just curious. I know it's kind of a uh, out of left field question, but how do you, how do you describe yourself to people? If someone says, well, who are you, man? I think of myself as a recording engineer, that that's my primary identity, I guess you would say. Even though in reality, I have spent more of my professional career being a drummer primarily, but even after, so I, uh, you know, I, I went from, uh, I, and plus I've been playing the drum since I was 10 years old. So I've thought of myself as a drummer forever. So it's really barely, I would say it barely, the recording thing barely trumps uh, playing the drums. But uh, I feel like my life revolves more around being a recording engineer than it does being a drummer. I actually can't tell you exactly why I kind of think of myself as a recording engineer producer mo more than a drummer because I don't know, especially in the last few years, I've been playing even more. I mean, I, I, so I'll, I'll give you a quick biography, sure. even if it's just to illustrate this point. Um, I just wanted to be on the cover of Modern Drummer Magazine my whole life. Like all, it's all I cared about. It's all I wanted to do was just be the best drummer of all time. So 
I wanted to go to jazz, uh, the jazz school to become an even better drummer. And, and yeah, you I, grew up in St. Louis, is that right? Yeah, I grew up in St. Louis. Yeah. I grew up way out in the country in St. Louis. So I wasn't in the, in the city, but I was close to that. So I could drive in, you know, and I lived in the suburbs. So it was easy to be able to do all the cool things you'd want to do in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. But I actually lived a pretty solitary life because my dad was a landscaper and we lived, we lived in, we really lived in the country. Like the population of my town was 168 people. You know, it was tiny. So, um, so yeah, I, I wanted to go to school for music. So I, I ended up going to UNT here in Denton, Texas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was great. That's, it's where I ended up meeting Centromatic. And that was my first, I, I did a couple of years at UNT and realized as soon as I, like all I cared about was being the best possible drummer. And then as soon as I saw punk rockers and art students and all these people playing their own original music on stage and, and oftentimes being, not even being, you know, not, not just not schooled musicians, but sometimes barely able to play, mm -hmm. really play. And the, it was just that their ideas were so strong that they were able to stand up on stage and just say, I have something to say. Yeah. And to me, there was nothing more powerful than that. It was mm -hmm. more powerful than somebody who really did understand music and who had this facility it was just so direct just mm -hmm. having an idea and communicating it to the audience what to year me, was that that you moved to denton i came here in the fall of 1990. so, so maybe uh, maybe throw out a couple of band names that would that that if in those early 90 years um i'm well, thinking first, you mean bands i was in or other bands that i was other in bands you were saying when you started seeing people on stage it started oh, uh, changing sure. your yeah do you remember some I of those, those really, folks well, Let's think. So it would be. Uh, was Rick uh, open at that time? Yes, Rick. Not when I. Yeah. yeah. It was definitely here soon after I got here. So it probably uh -huh. was already open. In fact, Rick's place, like uh, there was the there was the Doctor Smith's one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Was open. Oh, this is yeah. good. I'm actually, I'm I'm glad I remember this. And then uh, yeah. uh, Billy Goat played there. Yeah. Also, That's ten hands. That, that was an experience seeing Billy Goat, oh, wasn't it? Incredible. Yeah. Seeing, uh, man, see, you know, Trip, was, and Tripping was, Daisy. Well, Tripping Daisy, uh, they were not quite around. They they were down here exactly at that time. They were in the dorms, and uh, I was in Bruce Hall. They were in a nearby dorm. Can't remember the name of it. And they they developed like parallel to the very first band I was in, which was called Adams Farm. Adams Farm, and, yeah. And, and was Kill Billy? Did that proceed? That was. I think mm, I think Kill Billy proceeded at, at the same time. But you were that, your first band was Adams Farm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was my my freshman year. Wow. Oh man, it's so I can remember this so clearly. The, my freshman year, I go to see I go to the Rock Bottom Lounge at the University of Union, yeah. and I see Centromatic. First of all, that's why I came to UNT in the first place because I saw Matt Chamberlain playing in the Rock Bottom Lounge, and he okay. was in incredible. I didn't yeah. know that he'd already quit music school at the time. I thought that he was going here. I just was like, if if this can do that for him, I have to be here. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. mind blowing. Also, there was a guy that was in the two o'clock lab band that was just phenomenal. I just knew this was the place I wanted to be. So then I find myself a year later uh, going to the Rock Bottom Lounge and seeing a band called Adam's Farm and they had a drummer uh, and he was a great drummer. His name was Will. I actually love his drumming, but at the time, my mindset was still good drummer, modern cover of modern drummer oriented. I was really, yeah. Yeah. I was so naive. I had not learned anything about really making music yet. And this is a, this is really at the beginning of that, of my transformation. So I still was in, I, I liked Jeff, Jeff Whittington's songs a lot. And I loved the, what they were doing, but I just thought that they're, I just knew what I thought should happen with the drums. So I, walked up to Jeff at the, after the show and was like, um, I really love your band. And uh, I don't remember my exact words, but I basically told him, I, I think I would be a better drummer for you than your drummer. It was such a rude thing to say. The worst thing you could say to somebody after like, I, have, I was only you know 18 years old. I didn't have yeah. any idea what I was doing. Luckily yeah. enough, Will decided to leave the band the next semester. And that was so, Will, Will Saws, right? You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I know Will. Great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Will Saws. Yeah. Who uh, was coming, I greatly admire. It's so ironic. Yeah. I just yeah. was too young to get it. Like he was a Bill Berry style drummer. Right. So his, drum, 
very part oriented. He made up really cool parts, but his playing was kind of chunky and almost awkward in a way, just a lot like Bill Barry. And that's he, actually he something. and I he and I actually had a duo band together called, what? called the, yeah called the Nympho Mannequins. That is incredible. <laughs> that is such a great name. Too. It, it was. It was. Uh, we literally, I think, played one party. Uh, we never played out. It was more of just you know hanging out with friends and playing. But uh, yeah. Anyway, well, I came to greatly appreciate Will's drumming. I mean, when when I actually started, when I actually had to learn his parts and join the band, I was kind of like, oh wow, boy, I really, I thought this would just be no big deal. And it's not that I couldn't play them, but it was just putting yourself in somebody else's brain for a while. Yeah. It's one yeah. of the best things you can do as a musician is to have to learn somebody else's parts. And, and I don't think his, you know, it's, to be fair to Will, uh, he's a great guy and a fun drummer, but he his goal was was not to be a, the greatest drummer in the world, no. you know, as no. yours was. And, and yeah. uh, but anyway, so Adam's Farm, man, and, and that, that got you playing in Denton and you started yeah. seeing other bands. What got you into wanting to record and produce records it was just simple that i was listening to bands like guided by voices and mm -hmm. you know, nirvana and smashing pumpkins just the first wave of grunge music the original wave and anytime i would get recorded by somebody else uh it, I, it just was never raw enough it was always too slick it was just not interesting enough it was just very blah and i felt like i i just couldn't communicate to the engineer what I what I wanted and so I, I just I was just interested in I you know I've always been interested in the sound of the drums even when I was a kid I would notice how amazing Stuart Copeland's hi-hat work was but I would notice the sound of it and I would I didn't understand that there was such a thing as delay and I was just thinking that Stuart Copeland was the most amazing drummer which he was the most amazing yeah drummer. what an incredible drummer but still, I was just mystified by this idea of mm -hmm. how could he be doing this hi-hat thing that was just seemed to be, you know, like lapping over itself. And anyway, mm -hmm. I always had an ear for that. And consequently, I also, I'm kind of bad or I don't pay as much attention to lyrics, words. And I think there's something inherent to me, the way that I listen to music and the way that I hear things, the way that my brain works, for whatever reason, that I was drawn to the texture of music partially because it's hard for me oftentimes to understand what a singer is saying mm -hmm. and literally sometimes when i'm talking to somebody if they have a strong accent or they have or whatever i i have i think i have a little bit more trouble understanding people's words than other people do for instance mark hedman was the bass player in centromatic and played music with mark my whole adult life he's he was in he was in adam's farm yeah mark is the connection for me, I've I, I was playing music with Mark from the very beginning. Yeah. If, if I'm if I if I can't understand what some what's happening some somewhere if I can't understand a lyric or if we're talking to somebody and they're say they say something jumbled, I'll just ask Mark and he always yeah. somehow knows what the person is saying. Like his brain is built in a way that can understand language. Do you do you think you uh, as a consequence of that, uh, especially as you're producing someone? Um, and, and recording someone, do you think that it it becomes not that important that the voice just becomes like another instrument? That's definitely what happens for better or for worse. Yeah. And you could look at my, you could probably look at my records and uh, like the records that I've made and intuit that probably. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, you, you could just say that on some level subjectively, it's, um, it's true mm -hmm. that I don't, strive for that as much as some people do although i do ask singers i do care about the meaning of the words and i do ask singers sure. to clarify to whatever ability they are able to or are willing to mm -hmm. usually it's a choice mm -hmm. how humbly you're you're singing how much mm -hmm. you're communicating your exact you know your exact uh thought to the listener is is an artistic choice because yeah we all speak more clearly if we chose to and but and so you know uh, this guy this guy here uh, kind of is one of the guys responsible for turning uh, rock and roll into literature and the words became so much more important. But I got to tell you, man, as a as a songwriter myself, uh, the the meaning of the words comes third for me. Right. The 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 thing that that's first 
is is it it the sound itself has to fit the melody just right for sure and and it, it doesn't i don't care if it's nonsense words it's i am not going to take i'm not going to be forced driven by meaning of words to force it into it's, and and you know it when you hit it you know and a lot of the, like a lot of songwriters uh, my songs end up just being sort of nonsense sounds for a while because almost always the chord progression and the melody come first and then i kind of find the words from that point on but anyway uh ultimately i think that what happens is a, a meaning sort of emerges as opposed to i'm going to write a song about x which i occasionally do but but usually not and and that that cassette you you did of of, of will will's first thing what was that what was that called? Uh, well, Johnson's well, there, first thing. It, there is a, a jetpack. Uh, jetpack, yeah. You did that, didn't you? That's probably Will Fortrax, almost for sure. Almost for sure. I mean, it could be okay. some. I, I did an early Fortrax recording of Will's that is really good, but I don't know. I don't remember if it's been released as an official thing. I'm thinking. Uh, I think I'm thinking of the first Centromatic record. It, it, isn't that all pretty much Will and you and you did the re recording? Yes. In the first engineering. Record, which does sound like four tracks but it was not actually four tracks but it purposely was lo-fi and and that was that was I, I that, that recording. how long had you been recording people and producing at that point not long right that's the first record i ever made yeah wow uh, i had done recordings for <laughs> adam's farm but uh but not not an actual album in that way so you've got to so, be pretty proud of that if that's oh, your first I'm one very proud of it yeah. It was one of those things you just meet people and you you just know that, you, that what you want to do is what they want to do and, and the, it it just makes things so easy. Yeah. And I'm always trying to make the record that the artist wants to make anyway. But in a case like Will and myself, we wanted to do the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. we were always headed in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Will is actually an amazing example of somebody who you know, his lyrics are not very direct oftentimes they're very poetic yeah. and so you know you, you know he's he's not really even though he's prolific and he has parallels with bob dylan he he's not a bob dylan disciple right. um, i'm sure he's influenced by dylan's work there's no doubt but his, we all are <laughs> yeah his music doesn't directly relate to it in that way yeah because of what you're saying because will was he is a i think he's music first although he does obviously you know he's on a you know, a lifetime of songwriting development. So he's going to go through different phases. But Will always had that ability to just come up with the exact perfect, simple three-note melody that you wanted to hear. And sometimes those melodies would just, they would just make me tear up yeah. without having any relation to what, how I was feeling at the time or, or, the, or the song itself or what, and, and it ended up, I ended up ascribing meaning to those songs. And making up my own yes. meaning partially yes. because his lyrics weren't direct enough to stop right. me from doing that and yes. i will say i'm not drawn i'm repelled from music that is very very explicit in that way I, it's yes. not that i never like it but but if it's something that i'm not, if i'm not crazy about what the singer is saying and there's no other way to interpret it i won't probably revisit it i now. agree I agree, and I, I feel the same way about visual arts. You know, I even sure. as a kid, I, when I may, maybe with my parents to an art museum or whatnot, you know, the 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 realistic paintings, the ones, the the, the masterful things. You know, you you look at them and you admire them, but it's sort of like, you know, why not just take a picture? Why not take a photograph? Which, by the way, I want to ask you about your photography. But the 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 art that always compelled me, even as a child was the art that i didn't understand you know that 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 you you look at and you you say what the hell is that you know and 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 you have to you become a participant in the meaning of it as opposed to you're just kind of passive and and it's telling you what it is um man i don't want to take too much of your time here and and i think you and i could talk for hours let me ask you a couple of questions that i wanted to get to one is is your drumming and um i I'm going to sound a little bit like a fanboy, and sorry for that. But from the very get go that I saw you play live in Centromatic, there is something compelling about the way you play. And I, I it was almost strange 
Matt. I, I couldn't stop looking at you. I couldn't stop watching you play. And it, it felt almost odd, like, what is that? And I got to tell you, this has been confirmed by many other people I've talked to. They say, oh, absolutely, of course. Uh, and and uh, not just, well, but so I, you know, maybe you're not the person to ask why. Maybe you can't be objective about yourself. Do you have any ideas what that is and how, you know, why it is someone you have this presence on stage? Well, a couple, I have some thoughts about it. I, I, I have, I am aware that people, that the visual of me playing is compelling for people. It's not something that I ever tried to um, cultivate. Sort of, yeah, cultivate. I haven't tried to cultivate or anything. I definitely don't think of myself as somebody that looks cool when they're playing. When I see myself playing, I'm self-conscious like anybody would be. But there is something, there has always been something like a fluidity to my playing that I have always been aware of. Like, like you know what I was saying about uh, Will Saws earlier, that he had a rigidity or like a like almost a mechanical nature sometimes? Well, there are drummers that are like that, and that is part of your appeal that's why you like them because they are like that yeah when people like what i'm doing i think it's because they like that they like that fluidity you know mm -hmm. they, it seems easy when you're watching me play it seems like it's easy for me to do it which mm. um is i mean relatively true but that's not really i actually went through a long period when i was in jazz school i i used to have a million drums and cymbals when i was in high school it's like I would stick all the drums I owned together into one big drum set. And I was a huge fan of Stuart Copeland, so I wanted a bunch of little splash cymbals. I just wanted a million little voices. And then I noticed when I got into jazz school that the guys that I loved, they were doing it with almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me, it's really all in, the, in your mind. It's all about the parts you make up. It's, and, you, and my goal is to make up the most memorable thing, part I can make up. So I started playing for a lot. This is when I was still in jazz school. I started playing with one hand. I didn't, you know, mm. really put my hand behind my back, but I started to make up my drum fills just based on my right hand, just trying to do something that was simple and really cool, you know, that would be memorable later on. And I took away all those extra voices and I simplified my kit to be just one ride cymbal and a hi-hat. That might be part of it visually why it's appealing because there's not, a, there's almost nothing around me. You can actually watch me play because I don't have a bunch of drums in between yeah. me and the viewer, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that, that, that is a metaphor for how I feel. I feel like I'm trying to communicate with the audience and I don't want the drums to come in the way, to get in the way of that, you mm -hmm. know? So I've, uh, I just I've never to... made this connection before, but as you were talking, I, I for some reason, I, I thought of Paul Motion. Are you a, a fan of his drumming? Do you know him? I can't place it. I know the name for sure. Yeah. But I can't remember Jazz drummer. And one of the things he's known for is, you know, if, if you're looking for someone that just keeps time and is just that solid mechanical thing, he's not the guy. He's right. very creative in what he does. He, right. um, uh, it's almost like he turns the, the drums into a different sort of instrument with his creativity. And, and you're a little bit like that, but your time is super solid too. So you're able to accomplish both. I w I've always felt like I it was it was an okay arc for me to go through to be a technical drummer first and then to try to develop more of my creativity I felt like I was on some level stifled by learning how to play the drums it's like you're just learning a million shortcuts to get to the end result and I mm -hmm. didn't have to take the long cut I didn't have to go a long way the long way around you know so I got all these shortcuts to get me to the end result faster mm -hmm. so when I started to become a recording engineer I was determined not to let that happen so yeah. i made i i made i only taught myself how to record i didn't i didn't i didn't even read about recording i just experimented i mean i, wow. I started to do this at the exactly the wow. right time four yeah. tracks have been around for a long time they were cheap you could buy them in any pawn shop you know then adats came you know it was like the home recording revolution happened exactly when i could benefit from it it was just perfect but i still wow. have an inquisitive mind and i'm still technical in nature so Mm -hmm. it, almost immediately, I am like taking a half inch uh, eight track machine and I'm using Simpty, striping it with Simpty and slaving it to an ADAT. And that's what I did. That's what I used to make the first Centromatic record. Even though it sounds like it's a four track record, it's totally not. It's totally this hybrid, crazy design that I, you know, 
that I figured out how to do just on my own. And then I was triggering drums even back then from my from my roommate James's uh, keyboard. You know, I would sample it in into his keyboard myself, and then I had a little drum trigger pad that would that would sense sense it on the on from the tape, and then it would send a little trigger out and hit his keyboard. It was wow. a mess in reality, like all this latency, all these things that just you know you could only get away with it in certain scenarios. But I was just determined to make things sound the way I wanted them to sound. Which in reality, I know I kind of described it like I wanted things to sound more raw, but even back then, and it's true that the first Centromatic record sounds lo-fi, but it's not, it's not really a gar, it's not a, it's not truly a lo-fi record because I was trying to create many moments that were beautiful and rich and then infuse within them this real emotional feeling, which I, which we could get to by destroying some sounds and keeping some sounds very barbaric and, and just the opposite of that. And I, I, that's exactly what I do today to a T. That's, it's my goal with every record is that I want to create a world that's bigger than life that just feels like it's all around you and it's vibrant and beautiful, but nestled within it, there's this primitive, you know, the, these primitive elements that are just emotional and just reach to you emotionally. So that's beautiful, man. Speaking of, uh, you said what you're, Still doing today what are you working on now well i just finished uh the new john moreland record and i'm very very i've made his last record too and i played drums on it and mixed it and all, all that stuff and we just did the same thing with this new record and we john and i are very similar to will and i at like we just we're just thinking the same thing so often it's amazing how easy That's it cool. is to work with somebody like that where it's just you just feel like you're on the same page from the beginning. There's no guesswork. What I want to do is what he wants to do and vice versa. It's not that we, it's not that we don't have new ideas for each other or things that would surprise us, but as soon as we hear them, it's like, oh, of course, that would be great. I, I love that. Yeah. Awesome. And so I'm even going to make his next record. We just have developed kind of a, a just a cool thing. And John Calvin Abney, which who is the multi-instrumentalist that, that plays yeah. with John, He's also, I've been, he's been at the studio for the last couple of years, you know, in and out working with different people. And I love John Calvin so much. So that's really exciting to me. And I Very just, cool. I finished uh, mixing the new Delta Spirit record. So I'm excited about that. Oh, so, nice. Nice. Yeah. I'm going up to Canada uh, on Sunday to make a record with an artist uh, named Lucette. That's really fun and exciting. That'll be a good record. So in a studio up there, not, not in uh, Echo Lab. Yeah, that's one of the few. I, I don't work in other studios very often, but uh, the way that this works, the, the Canadian government is giving uh, Lauren grants to do this, and so we're we're forced to do it. Not, I don't mean to say forced, but forced, that's one yeah. of the requirements that we need yeah. to do it. Uh, say something about your photography. I know I know it's something that's important to you. What do you, how do you uh, how do you think about your photography? Where does it kind of fit in your world, and what are some of your ideas about photography? Well, in a lot of ways photography has fallen to the wayside for me, mostly for technical, technological reasons. It's like, I also, I, I think there's something maybe that has to do with, for me, looking through a lens is an experience and I wanna to try to translate that experience to the viewer. And as soon as I got into using a DSLR, I was creating tens, hundreds of thousands of images. And it was this backlog of material that I had to slog through in order to present them to anybody. Plus I, I'm meticulous, so I would wanna color correct them and blah, 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 right? It really, I mean, I did, and I did this for years. So, I mean, I, it was very satisfying and fun, that whole process, but I, w I was increasingly, brought down by this knowledge that I was going to shoot these photos and that in the end I I was afraid that I was not going to be that they were not going to be viewed by that I was not going to be able to process the information to have other people see them at the same time so that was like a little bit but we were touring around the world and we were having all these exciting times that I wanted to document I have a terrible memory and it was really great for me to be able to document things with a camera because it actually strengthened those memories for me. And it is funny how people, you find that about an artist and their art, that that's, 
oftentimes the art is directly related to, if not born from, some deficiency in their personality. It, yes. It's just how it works. You know? Yes. Yeah. So it's an important thing to recognize. And, and that really so is interesting. It's not, in, so, so then, and then time is going on and, and I'm touring uh, and having a lot of great times and shooting lots of photos and really loving it. But I, in the back of my mind, I'm noticing that I'm not able to, I'm just not able to process those images to reach very many people. And consequently, you know, phones are getting to be amazing. Our yes. iPhone is starting to get yes. to be amazing. And I'm starting Crazy. to get my little lenses for my iPhone. And so That's I'm it. noticing the disparity there of how good the phone is getting and how much effort I'm putting into this. And I'm spending time that I would be spending either with my family, you know, like, like personal time or working on some project. And there just was a calculation. So I just started to step away from it being a serious hobby and or a profession because at one point I was serious about it. I, I, you know, in another life, it could easily have been the thing that I wanted to pursue as my career. I, I was, yeah. I, I cared about it, you know, but, but those two things kind of, kind of, and then as that's happening, Instagram is starting to blow up and now everybody, not only am I able to take great picture, but everybody's doing it. And now it's not such a special, a special thing anymore. And I will admit that part of why I felt comfortable doing it was because I felt like people don't mind me taking their pictures so much because I obviously have this good camera and I'm serious about it. Yeah. So they are more okay with it. As, as people are taking pictures of each other constantly with their phones, I felt like it just made me more timid about being, I, just, I don't know how to say this, but I just felt myself shrinking away from it a little bit. You know? I think I understand. I think I understand. It, 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 uh, there's probably a parallel with music, although I think that uh, it will never be, we'll, we'll never get to a point where people are able to produce quality music the way they are to, able to produce. The d democratization of photography will not be the democratization of, of music just because it is much easier to record music. Anyone can record pretty decent sounding music and and put it out there on and in many different places you know so different than when i was a kid and you had to be signed by a record company so there is that democratization but it's not like photography it, it you, you there's so much crap out there now you know but there's yeah. some really good photography out there with people who oh, have yeah. no training and nothing more than a phone Amazing. hey man let's finish if you don't mind but with some with some kind of colbert style rapid rapid questions sure. uh is that is that cool with you yeah. yeah. So let's see. Um, if not music, and and try to make these super quick answers. If if not music, what what might you have done with your life? I would have been a psychologist or a therapist. That's okay. Me. I am uh, doing. I'm sorry, you asked for short answers. No, it's okay. I am definitely partially doing therapy by recording bands. Recording bands is so magical because you are you are performing therapy on somebody. You, you're you're in an intimate, safe environment where you can have very good conversations that are very deep, and you can really you can really get there. And it's also a little bit like being um, a mentor. Like you're yeah. teaching every you're teaching a young band how to record. Yeah. You know they're going to go away from this. The next recording they're going to be better at it. And I just love those aspects of it. That's maybe that's part of why I think of myself as more of a recording engineer than a drummer because I, I do feel like I'm yeah I do feel like it's it's more maybe recording is more an expression of me than drumming is but uh, wow. whatever. very very interesting um, pretty rapid fire I will admit yeah uh, um, uh, let's see what what book comes to mind if I say favorite book that you've ever read your whole life oh that's a hard one um, oh I know it I, is just favorite book Oh man. Or just something, you know, that comes to mind when you think of some of the great books that you've read that have, have left a strong impression on you. There's, um, a, uh, a book called foundation and it's uh, it's a series of books. It's science fiction and it's, uh, Asimov. It's just so mm -hmm. incredible. So amazing. Love it. Love that, that series. If, if you could only listen to one record and I know this is impossible, but you know, the, the, uh, the old cliche question, what record is it? I don't think that's that hard. It's Bruce Springsteen's uh, Born to Run. Wow. And the reason I know that is because traveling from 
here to St. Louis so many times in college. That's a 12 hour drive, roughly a 12 hour drive for me because I stop a lot. Um, I listen to that album more than any other album. And it just, I mean, I just know I've been influenced by and I have spent more time loving that music, that collection of music more than any other collection. It's a great record for sure. Uh, most memorable show you've attended, gig, or I mean, uh, music show you've attended. Um, it's probably, I have a really bad memory, so I, it's hard for me to come up with, uh, the, like, I wish I was good. It's re one reason I'm not a great storyteller, but we played this, um, this festival in Spain where we were able to see the Pixies reunite and phosphorescent was there. So we hung out with phosphorescent on the lawn. It, it's in Barcelona. I should be able to remember any, any other member of Centromatic would be able to recall this in a heartbeat, but, um, that festival was was just about my favorite event, you know, musical event of of, of being a uh, being a, wa a watcher of, you know. If you could play drums for one uh, band or artist that you've not played with before, who would who would that be? Well, this might be surprising, but I I would I actually love Ray LaMontagne's music so much i mean so much yeah. and i know that would be a very very satisfying set to play he he has really created music that really touches me and uh yeah i i think that would be an amazingly fun gig to have dog or cat well dog but but I, if i could uh... <laughs> oh that's mavis and then yeah. in here are usually several other cats in here. So yeah. we have so both in, in this family, uh, we have five cats and one dog. Okay. Right on. Look, the dog is five times as big as all the cats. What happens when we die? Oh, well, I'm, uh, no, nothing happens when we die. Uh, I am, I'm an atheist and I wish mm -hmm. that there's a part of me that would love to be, uh, more open to, uh, other ideas uh like i'm not closed down to the idea that there is a higher power and i don't wish there was i mean i to be honest i i wish there was there just came a time in my life when i just recognized that i that's how i feel i mm -hmm. know that there's not um some magical man in the sky that's looking down individually at us and helping us individually or or controlling us or whatever now that doesn't mean that there's not an amazing amount of spiritual and magical stuff that happens in the world there is and there are things that connect humans that will we cannot understand yet right so i absolutely believe that there's so much more to the story of being a human being and mm -hmm. you know we will discover more of those things as we develop as a you know as a species and uh i i definitely I like, it's easy to believe in alternate dimensions. It's easy to believe in, you know, there's all kinds of like, what is dark matter? You yeah. know, like there are so many mysteries out there that they can all be explained, but I feel like the way that we looked upon, you know, cavemen and, and their ridiculous theory, that's how we, we will be perceived one day. So who am I to say one way or the other? But right I think on. the thing that I think of as me, the ego that says, this is Matt Pence, will stop when I'm done, when I'm dead. I, that, I don't think that will. If, if you've not read it, I highly recommend Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. Do you know the book? Sam Harris is, I mean, I am, uh, he is one of my favorite people. Yeah. I am so influenced by Sam Harris. Yeah, I, me too, me too. I use the Waking Up app and I've been listening to his podcast for 10 years and just, you know, it's just, I, he just speak what I'm, what I am thinking it just feels like he's already there and articulating it perfectly when it comes to most issues. I just love yeah. him. I agree. He does make it difficult sometimes to be a fan because he, um, uh, while, while I'm with him about the fact that the left sometimes eats itself uh, with how extreme, I'm, I'm with him with that, but he takes it a little too far for me. Sometimes it almost gets, starts getting uncomfortable. But, but th that book in particular is so good because he really articulates in his amazing way. He's just, his, his mind is just so incredible that, that religion 
misses the boat in terms of being, you know, uh, about fantasy and ignoring science. Science misses the boat on the other side of the ditch on ignoring the fact that there are transcendent experiences that humans have. Now, we don't have to extrapolate from that a man in the sky, as you said, but there is more to life than science. <laughs> And, and, and we do have, there are things that are not explainable and there are such things as transcendent experience and we, there's things about this life we are never probably going to understand. I wouldn't say that science is, is ignoring those things. It just hasn't gotten there yet. And so yeah. science has, is a, it's just, it has to build up, you know, we cannot, we cannot make that leap to try to allow. For, so I think science is just concentrating on the current, the level that it's trying to build at this time. I actually think a lot of science scientists are open. I mean, pretty open-minded. If you're open-minded about, you know, like yes. if, if you're open-minded about, uh, you know, quantum theory, you would have to be open-minded to this yes. idea that you never know what's how many dimensions are there in reality, or or yeah. if we think about a multiverse, you know, I mean, that's pretty open-minded to to me, and I feel like that's most people that have a scientific mind frame. That's that's what they're I, I think I think that's an open mindedness that is I'm done with that. That yeah. sentence is over. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Heck, okay, man, last question. When you're dead and gone, what do you hope people are, will say about you? Mm. Yeah, just that I treated my fellow human beings with kindness. You know, that's the most important thing to me. Uh it's just the golden rule is is everything to me. So I, I just want people to know how much I love them and for them to, to have felt loved by me. You know? What a beautiful way to finish the conversation, man. Uh, and, and there's so much I had planned to talk about. Maybe uh, you know, down the road we can do part two of this, this conversation. But uh, in the meantime, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan, and it's been fantastic getting to know you. And I appreciate you taking the time to connect with me today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll see you down the road, man. Thank you.